It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. President Putin of Russia did not wait for Donald Trump to sign or veto the sanctions bill against Russia, Iran, and North Korea. The bill was passed by Congress last week. Russia has retaliated already against the U.S. sanctions by demanding that U.S. reduce its mission staff in Russia by 755, no later than September. Russia has also blocked access to property used by U.S. diplomatic staff in response to U.S. seizing two Russian diplomatic properties here in the U.S. Russian government spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said there was no point in waiting for Donald Trump to sign the bill into law as the legislation was adopted in Congress already. He also said that U.S. would have to demonstrate the political will to improve relations with Russia by rehabilitation from aggravation of political schizophrenia. The U.S. Vice President Mike Pence spoke out against Russia's retaliation and its activities while in Estonia. Let's listen. President Trump has called on Russia to cease its destabilizing activities in Ukraine and elsewhere and to cease its support for hostile regimes like North Korea and Iran. And under President Trump, the United States will continue to hold Russia accountable for its actions. And we call on our European allies and friends to do the same. In a sign of our commitment, very soon President Trump will sign legislation to strengthen and codify the United States sanctions against Russia. Regrettably, last week Russia took the drastic step of limiting the United States diplomatic presence in their nation. Joining us today to discuss the deteriorating U.S.-Russia relations is Richard Sakwa. He is professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent and an associate fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. His upcoming book is Russia Against the Rest, Pluralism and the Post-Cold War Crisis of World Order. Richard, good to have you back. My pleasure. Richard, uh, when President Obama left office, he imposed sanctions against Russia. He actually confiscated two Russian retreat compounds and asked diplomatic staff to return to Russia, all for alleged interference in the U.S. elections and hacking into the DNC email server. Remind us all of this, because we live in the USA, the United States of amnesia, as Gore Vidal used to say. But uh, take us back. Uh, tell us how this all got started. Yes, uh, this was uh, Obama's one of his final actions, which was the expulsion of 35 Russian diplomats on the 29th of December, uh, as well as the uh, sequestration, confiscation, effectively, of two Russian-owned compounds, one in Maryland, one in uh, upstate New York. Uh, so at that time, late December, Putin did not respond. He wanted uh, to see what Trump would do once he comes into office after the 20th of January. And as you know, for the last six, seven months, uh, there has been a sort of a hiatus while Russia was uh, anticipating perhaps an improvement in relations. I mean, there's much talk of uh, an exaggerated uh, expectation in Moscow about what could be done in Washington. But nevertheless, there was a sort of hope that after the endless pile of problems which had accumulated in the Obama years that a new leader would offer as often a new opportunity, if not a new reset. Uh, as you know, they then met in Hamburg at the G20 summit in July, and uh, they had quite a good conversation for two hours, 15 minutes, much longer than anticipated, and some informal discussions. But uh, as far as Russia is concerned, two things. First, uh, that Obama in his final months or final weeks did almost everything possible to set a, a number of uh, mines or to poison the well, if you like, of good relations, like putting in uh, poisoning the well so that his successor really wouldn't really be able to do much or get started, certainly not immediately. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to the issues of collusion alleged uh, and so on later. So uh, uh, Russia in the last few weeks has desperately, well, not desperately, but then forcefully saying, look, these two compounds were illegally uh, confiscated. We want them back. Um, 
And then the United States side was saying they're putting all sorts of conditions. And ultimately, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and with the uh, voting in of the sanctions uh, last week, which are quite draconian, actually, uh, that it was to be expected that there would be a reaction. I'm a bit surprised about the uh, the scale of it. I thought that maybe up to 100 U.S. diplomats would be uh, expelled, but and that the the Serbian uh, Bor Dutch or country house where the U.S. Uh, diplomats can go out of town uh, would be uh, confiscated. But the scale of it that the, the U.S. is now being asked to reduce its diplomatic staff, including support staff, down to the same level as Russia's, which is uh, just about 450. So. It's quite a draconian response, but uh, it was anticipated, but the scale of it is larger than I expected. Richard, tell us about how significant these sanctions are that the Russians are now responding to. Uh, this is far more serious. Uh, in, in, well, me the specific measures uh, may not be so significant, uh, but uh, in fact they are in many ways. Uh, but they, uh, it's a step change in a number of ways. First, they were not coordinated with the allies in the European Union, so that they were unilateral, which is a sign that Congress constantly condemned Trump for his unilateralism. And then what does Congress do? It imposes these things without consultation with its allies. Second, it's quite explicit that the United States is hoping to achieve economic advantage out of them. So in other words, it's a type of that typical, again, Trumpian mercantilism, in affecting uh, European energy interests, above all, the building of Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2, uh, from near St. Petersburg to Germany. Uh, and thirdly, the, the scale of it, the, 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 these sanctions are a declaration that U.S. law is universal across the world. So it isn't just affecting U.S. companies, it's affecting any company initially uh, even which even had a slight involvement in an economic energy project in which a Russian company was involved. Uh, after discussion, it went up to uh, where a Russian company has got over about 35% uh, engagement. So, but it's quite draconian. So it's, a, it's why I say, yes, it is incremental in some ways, but it's a huge jump at the same time. Uh, I don't know what uh, has seized uh, uh, Congress in imposing these, uh, these draconian measures. Uh, and this is only the beginning of uh, the response. This is the first element. Uh, Putin himself is trying to keep things down, but he has been under enormous pressure. I was in St. Petersburg a few weeks ago, and even people with relatively liberal views were saying that uh, are condemning Putin for not having reacted to Obama's uh, provocations at the end of December last year. So uh, he... Uh, has done the minimum, really, to uh, to satisfy Russian public opinion, who is, uh, as you can imagine, over the last uh, few months, just getting fed up with this sort of, uh, what they perceive to be craziness coming out from Washington. Now, I think most of us thought, with Tillerson's appointment as Secretary of State, being a former Exxon CEO and having energy relations with Russia in the past, U.S. was hoping to improve their relations with Russia, not sink them into the ground further. How will these sanctions affect Russian and corporate relations, in particular with Russia? In the short term, this works to the advantage of the uh, fracking gas lobby, because they were talking explicitly about um, being able to fill the gap, uh, perceived gap, or possible gap in European gas market by uh, exporting, selling uh, LNG, uh, liquid, uh, liquid um, form of natural gas. So uh, that, in, that may be to their advantage of the gas fracking industry. However, all the others, as you mentioned, ExxonMobil, uh, where um, Tillerson, um, Secretary of State Tillerson, used to be the CEO, uh, are not at all happy. More than that, the U.S. Department of Justice slapped a $2 million fine. It's, it's more petty cash, but nevertheless, a fine for having signed the contract in, uh, uh, in 2011-12 with Rosneft for the exploration of Arctic uh, sea oil and other hard-to-get oil, including uh, in the Black Sea. So I think that some U.S. corporations will not be uh, particularly happy but uh, there's, 
uh, the, the, the scale of U.S.-Russian economic links are relatively small. So that's not, I think, a decisive factor. It's the, U- it's the European companies who are hopping mad at the moment, to be absolutely honest, because there's a, just in this last uh, few months, to, uh, the German exports to Russia have gone up 20%, despite sanctions. So what this is uh, doing is going back to the 1980s, when the Reagan administration tried to stop the building of the Yamal uh, and the West Siberia gas pipelines to Western Europe in the first place. And they imposed uh, quite severe sanctions, but the Germans, French and others refused to accept it. And now what's happening, this is going to drive the wedge between the Europeans and the United States. Now, Richard, uh, Russians resist these sanctions partly because in the last few years, the Russian economy has really suffered uh, due to the sanctions by the U.S. as well as uh, European countries. How will these sanctions affect the Russian economy at this time? Well, they're coming out of crisis. Uh, Yes, for two years, 2015, 2016, these were really tough years. In 2015, the Russian economy uh, contracted by 3.7% last year. Um, by just uh, about 1%. Uh, This year, there's going to be a return to economic growth. In short, the sanctions do not have a major economic effect. It makes business more difficult, uh, especially now in the the financial and energy sectors. However, many Russians see the sanction regime as actually a bit of a blessing in disguise. Russian agriculture is booming. Uh, massive investments is moving into fields which it didn't have before, that is meat production, chicken, pork, uh, others, uh, which the uh, United States used to sell uh, to, to Russia, which, of course, they can't do now. So, and other sectors, even, for example, uh, the ban or Ukraine post ban on gas turbine engines for uh, ships, they've now managed to devise their alternatives. Even deep sea, deep ocean, even um, drilling, They've managed to get some technology from China, but above all, they've developed their own responses. So Russia is becoming much more self-sufficient. And over the last few years, Russia has been working very hard to become sanctions proof. So in economic terms, it won't have much effect. it's, It's annoying. It makes life more difficult in certain sections, but it won't change. But above all, it won't change Russian political behavior. In fact, it will have the exact opposite effect to that intended. It will stiffen Russian resolve. It will, at the moment, uh, it, it will make even more what is at the moment the view in Moscow that Russia, that the United States is a country with which you cannot deal. as they say in Russian. You can't deal with these people. And I think after this, this events of this last week, they won't try. To deal anymore. In other words, okay, on the ground in Syria and in other places, perhaps we can talk. Ukraine, perhaps we can get a deal. But basically, uh, I think it's a total breakdown of Russia's trust in the ability, not just of Congress, but also of the presidency, to be able to deliver anything substantive, not just for Russia, but in terms of global public goods over North Korea, over Iran, over Syria over Ukraine and many, many other issues, including global warming. All right, Richard, uh, we're going to end this segment for the time being, and we're going to continue our discussion uh, with you, um, particularly just stepping back a bit and taking a a wider look at the geopolitical uh, space that Russia is in and how these sanctions, uh, particularly not only against Russia, but also uh, against Iran in the same bill, uh, is pushing Russia and Iran closer uh, together, um, alienating uh, both of these countries um, and the implications that's going to have in terms of geopolitics. I thank you so much for joining us for now, and let's continue in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.